Welcome to the TJ Malden Leadership Podcast, where we talk about life, leadership, and the gospel. (sighs) What's up, everybody? Uh, So thankful that you would take your time. I know I always say this, but I'm incredibly grateful that you would spend some time hanging out with me and the crew talking about life, leadership, and the gospel. And today I want to talk about something that, that I feel like was really Interesting. Uh, I saw this thing. I was reading the other day. I saw this thing where NASA had posted, or some organization had posted, this sign, uh, kind of as motivation or encouragement. And it said this: really simple. It was about a bee. And I'm kind of into honeybees, and so like I, I like them. I have friends that have hives. They're kind of cool. They're, they're they're just interesting, and they make the world go around. So I saw the bee thing, and I, it kind of sparked my interest. And I read it, and it said aerodynamically. A bee's body is not made to fly. The good thing is the bee doesn't know. And I was like, hmm, all right, cool. Like aerodynamically, a bee's body is not built to fly, but the bee doesn't know. So obviously it's this idea hinting at or encouragement of like, hey, you know what? You just, you just be you and you can do great things and just don't listen to doubt and you're unstoppable, you know? But the reality is I was like, man, I got to know more. So I started digging. And what I find out is that from the outside appearance or looking in on a bee, that's kind of true. The, the, the actual size the landscape of their wings versus the size of their body, it doesn't make sense for their wings to be able to lift them off the ground. Now, a hundred years ago, if you were to look at that and you were to look at the physics of it and try to figure that out, you would be mesmerized. You would, you would, it would be an anomaly. You would think, man, this is a miracle. But then, you know, all these years later with all the technology that we have, we discovered that a bee flaps their wings 230 times a second. So, Underneath the surface, the way that their wings are joined together, their wings are actually able to do this kind of figure eight motion. And it's this rapid motion flapping of the wings that lifts this oversized body off the ground. And as I was reading that and doing the research, I thought, man, this is, this is the deal. There's something unseen. There's an unseen element at work that manifests itself in movement. And then, obviously, I I just started spiraling in my own heart and my own mind. I'm like, how many unseen things are at play in our lives that either lift us and move us in the direction that we're called to be and that we're supposed to go, or how many unseen things are holding us back from who we're supposed to be and where we're supposed to go? And I'll say this, it's always the unseen things that are, I believe, that are the catalysts that take us to our goal, that ignite our passion, or it's the unseen things that trip us up and cause us to fail. Because hear me say it like this, the unseen is always made visible, always. And everything you see is a manifestation of the unseen, right? Like, I mean, you think about this. Um, you, You look at a bodybuilder, I can use this example. A bodybuilder, man, they're chiseled. Their physique is, I mean, their muscles are huge. Their body, like, you see them flex. You see the end goal. You see the, the sculpture of a person, but you don't see the hours and hours and hours of meticulously combing through their diet and looking at their macro. You don't see the hours and hours in the gym. So all of the unseen things are working and building and cultivating who you will be seen as. So preparation and skill development that occur, and I'll say this, if you're, if you want to be a leader, if you're leading an organization, if you have some goal that you want to accomplish, if you have some skill that you want to master, it is the time, the effort, the attention to detail, and the willingness to work behind the scenes when no one is watching, when no one's giving out awards, when there are no participation trophies, whatever that looks like, it is a commitment to the unseen grind that will propel you in the seen dimension, all right? And consistency is evidence. Occasionally, you'll see somebody do something great. They'll sing a great song, right? They'll say something that's, that's full of wisdom and, or they'll make a good decision in the heat of the moment. And sometimes you can catch lightning in the bottle, but more times than not, 
you see someone do something excellently in public because they have failed a million times in private until they got it right. And so you may be asking like, okay, TJ, how can I then cultivate or develop myself in the unseen? I love this quote by Beecher. He says, hold yourself responsible for a higher standard than anyone else expects of you and never excuse yourself. Like never make excuses for yourself. That happens in the unseen. That happens in the behind the scenes. Most people don't quit in front of everyone. Most people don't quit when they're on the stage. Most people don't quit when they're the CEO. Most people quit when cultivating the gift gets too tough. When making the right choice when no one is watching begins to be too costly. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says it like this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So it's like, my, my question I would ask is this, the things that you want to achieve, the things that you want to, or even you aspire to be, the things that maybe you want God to do in your life or in the people's lives around you, are you willing to be immovable? Are you willing to be steadfast in the unseen? Are you willing to grind when no one sees you to accomplish something great for God, for yourself, for your family, or for your organization? And so that, that's kind of the first thing. The, the, the unseen is always made visible, and you can cultivate the unseen by committing to that skill. To, I'll, I'll never forget this. Um, i just give you a quick example. When I was learning to play the guitar, and I'm not very good at it at all. Matter of fact, I don't even play at our church on Sundays anymore because I'm like I'm not I'm I'm just I'm not great. Um, I'm I'm passable on a guitar. Like I can I can lead worship in a pinch with an acoustic, but I'm not I'm not proficient at it. But I remember when I was just learning acoustic, um, and I hated looking down to change the chords. Like I would have to look like okay, am I going to get this right? And so for about a year. I would lay uh, in bed at night and turn the lights off and play the guitar in the dark. And my habit of looking down, I couldn't see what I was doing even because it was dark. And so I intentionally played in the dark at night in my bed and I would, you know, it was, it was just crazy. And now when I do lead, it's funny because I leave worship with my eyes closed. And so it's dark and I was changing the chords and it's just, you know, it's the unseen things that help you become proficient. Now, I'm not, I'm not a great acoustic, but I can, I can play now, right? Because I was willing to, to work and, and do the hard work behind the scenes. The second thing is this. The unseen, when I'm talking about cultivating those disciplines and those habits or doing the work behind the scenes that it takes to get where you want to go and reach your goals, lead your organization, parent your kids, love your spouse, whatever that looks like, the unseen can be some of the most unenjoyable, difficult, and lonely parts of the journey. Uh, uh, Tiger Woods said this. He's one of my favorite golfers, him and Phil Mickelson, rank up there. And um, Scotty Scheffler's pretty awesome. But he said this, when he's preparing for, and he started this when he was a kid, when he's preparing for a tournament, <clears throat> he wants to get a 1,000 contacts with a club a day. A thousand contacts with a club a day, and he broke it down one time. He said that would typically look like a um, hundred balls at the driving range, three hundred chipping, and six hundred putting every single day. And you think about, and that that's lonely. Like, who wants to hang out with you when you're putting six hundred times? Like, like most fifteen year olds don't want to do that. That I, I think about, man, that must have been a lonely season in his life. But the difficult becomes easier as it becomes more common. And so as you're journeying to get better at your craft, get better at your skill, become a better leader, become a better parent, become a better pastor, maybe you're a pastor and you're listening to this, like the difficult disciplines that do at times feel lonely and unenjoyable and tough, they become easier as it becomes more common. As you incorporate discipline into your life, it does truly get easier. Um, uh, I'll say this, and I told somebody I was going to share this, maybe even my wife last night, I don't know, I might have told Tay this. At risk of sounding arrogant um, or egocentric, I'm going to tell the story from like a week ago. Um, I don't know, y'all know me, y'all been listening this long enough. I'm not trying to be arrogant, I'm not trying to be egocentric, but I'm just going to tell the story. Um, someone asked me, they they listened to a sermon that I preached, and they say, hey, can, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, they said, 
and this is the the whole conversation in a nutshell. They said, D- "Where do you get your lesson plans from? Like who who writes this stuff that you deliver? Like do you, do you get lesson plans?" And I was like, "Um, I'd never been asked that question. Kind of caught me off guard." I was like, "Um, God, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know." I was like, "They're like, they're like, no, seriously, like, like, do you, you know?" And they're an educator, so they were thinking about lesson, literally lesson plan, lesson plans, and getting lesson plans and stuff, and. And I said, no, I said, you know, I, and then it, we, we started having this conversation and I said, no, I've just, I've always just kind of read the word and prayed. And my process is like, I pray, I read, I build the framework of the sermon that I feel like God desires me to deliver. And then I'll read two or three other commentaries. I may listen to two or three other sermons from like Charles Spurgeon or uh, Jonathan Edwards, some some old historical figure to see their perspective, and then a contemporary, um, someone that I trust and know, and and just to get feedback and look, and I was like, but I, you know, I, I've never, I, I don't. That's an interesting question. I was like, no, I've always, you know, I've always written my own sermons and my own content, and um, but it made me think. It was like, in in her mind, she was saying, TJ, it just one, your sermons are incredible. And I mean, she was very, I mean, very kind, very gracious. She was like, they're always interesting and they're so engaging. And, and so it made me go down this rabbit trail of like, okay, what does my prep look like? What does my behind the scenes look like with my preaching? Like why? And, and I have, I've gotten a lot of compliments over the years over my preaching. And this is what I realized. So I came to faith at 16. I started preaching three months later and, um, I was going to school. I was a high schooler. Um, and I worked at Red Lobster in Albany, Georgia. And I would work till about 11 o'clock at night. And I would get off work at 11 o'clock at night. And I would study my Bible until about 2 a.m. Every single night. Uh, it, was, it was a non-negotiable for me. And um, there were a lot of nights. I mean, hundreds of nights that I would... I would read until I fell asleep or I would read and I would take notes and I, I was so in love with the word and with God and with the gift of preaching and the idea that like I had this responsibility to deliver this message to people that I would write notes. Like if I thought of something, I would write these notes down on um, a legal pad and I would lay it beside my bed where I would step out onto it because I was so afraid of forgetting what I felt like God had told me. So I put it like right by my bed. I would get up the next morning and I'd write and but I did that. That was my my habit every single night. And I would read the Bible, read the Word for hours and hours and hours. And it wasn't just because you think, oh, TJ, you you must have been like hyper-disciplined and, you know, God gifted you with that. I was like, no, I was lonely. <laughs> like I'd become a Christian and all my friends that weren't Christians were like, hey, we're not inviting you to the parties anymore. Like we're, 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 you're, you're not in the in crowd anymore. And so this difficult, lonely season that I was walking through as a Christian early on actually pressed me to a place where behind the scenes, my solace was in the Word of God, digging in His Word, trying to understand His heart, learning about historical figures. And so now, 22 years later, I get it. You know, people people listen to a sermon or people ask a biblical question and it feels at times like second nature for me to, to deliver a sermon. And that, that's when I feel most, I love preaching God's word. But I'm like, man, all of the unseen, all of those years of difficulty and loneliness and, and all of those things, those are things that really created um, and qualified me. And I still don't super, feel super qualified, but, but all of those things enabled me to step in in front of people with confidence in the Lord because I knew him so well from his word. And so I don't think it's because I'm a crafty, you know, I'm some brilliant guy or a crafty speaker or I can turn a phrase well. I think that in, in, for this podcast, I was thinking about this thing in particular. I was like, man, it's because there were literally thousands and thousands and thousands of hours that were unseen of me looking at the word of God and me just asking God to show me his heart. And so there may be something in your life to where you say, I want to be a great dad, TJ. I want to be a great husband. 
I want to be a great leader at work. I want to be a great student. I want to be a great friend. Like, like what can I do that would make me better in those areas? My, my heart for you is that you would just turn a mirror around on yourself for a minute and say, what are the things that I'm doing in the unseen that are affecting those areas of my life? Like, like, am I reading a parenting book when I'm by myself? Am I trying to understand discipline, you know, in children? Am I, you know, if your job's a mechanic, like in my downtime, am I, am I picking apart like the way different engines work and the way different oils affect different kinds of, I don't know. I'm not a mechanic, but like, are you doing things in the unseen that sets you up to win when you're visible? Like, and I don't mean just to get the win so that you look good in front of people, but are you doing things to qualify yourself, even if you never get the stamp of approval. And I guess that that's what I would say. Like, my church could fire me tomorrow. They literally could, based on our government. It's anytime they wanted to, they could call a vote and be like, deuces, bro. This is what I know. I have God's stamp of, of approval. Like, because I know what goes on behind the scenes. I know what goes on in the unseen. So here's my question. This is what I'm, I'm even pressing on my life in other areas, not just preaching, but like, who am I in the unseen and how is it affecting what is seen? Like how hard am I flapping those wings? 230 beats per minute for the bee. Like how hard am I working when no one sees so that I accomplish the things that God has for me in my life? Um, and I said it earlier, like that can be a lonely road when you're committed to the unseen, when you're committed to being different, to walking full of integrity and character. It means that sometimes all your your friends may take a left and and you have to go right because it's against your convictions or your boundaries. First Peter 3.14 says, But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. Um, now, when I think back on that season, especially super young when I was digging into the Word, like I just wanted to know God. And I knew that I was called to and wanted to deliver His Word to the world for the rest of my life in any way possible. And there was... There was like a two-year window where I hardly preached at all, but I led worship like three or four times a week for two years. And in my mind, I was still delivering the word. I was just getting to do it with music. And so find that thing in your life that you want to do for the glory of God and for other people. Commit to cultivate that behind the scenes and then just do it. Start flapping those dang wings, man, you know? So anyways, three takeaways. I'm gonna give you really quick and we can wrap this up. Number one is this. Know who you are and where you're going and know that who you are and where you're going is being cultivated. This is a non-negotiable. It is being cultivated in the unseen. Who you will become, where you will go, happens in the dark, happens in the unseen, happens in the unseen discipline. The second thing is this, keep flapping those wings. Like just keep going. You may be in a season where you say, TJ, I'm lonely. Like I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be a good parent, but I'm the only one in our, in our house, in my family that's trying to be a good parent. Or TJ, I'm a single parent and I, I've never had good parenting modeled in front of me. Keep flapping those wings. Keep reading those books. Keep diving into the word. TJ, I want to be a good boss, but man, the boss that was before me, he was a micromanager and he was unkind and he was harsh. Listen, find a mentor. Keep flapping those wings. Keep moving forward. And the last thing is this. I'll say this. Here's a takeaway. And maybe just an encouragement. Who cares what other people think, right? You say, well, TJ, if, I, if I'm disciplined, if I have to say no to certain things, or if I set certain boundaries in my life, or if, if I don't get to hang out as much, like what will people think of me if my behavior begins to change for me to reach my goals? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Like, uh, and I'll harken back to the, to the bee thing, right? A bee's body is not made to fly. Good thing the bee does not know. To look in on the bee's life, you would say, there's no way this is possible. There will be dreams, visions, goals, desires, some that you have and some that God even puts in your heart that you'll want to accomplish that the world would look in on and say, it's impossible. Who cares? Who cares? Flap those wings. Find that passion. Work in the unseen and you will be, here's my guarantee, if you work on your discipline, you work on your character, you work on your work ethic behind the scenes, you commit to that passion when no one is watching and there is no telling what God will do when the lights are turned on.
There's no telling what will happen when the opportunity is presented itself. I can guarantee you this, you'll be ready for it. But if you don't work in the unseen, you won't be ready. So work, flap those wings, baby, and watch God do what only he can do. I love y'all. I appreciate you hanging out with me. Um, I, I always do. It means a great deal to me. And listen, if there's a topic you want us to cover, if you have questions that you have, remember you can always email us at TJ Mon Leadership Podcast at gmail.com. I love you guys. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the TJ Malden Leadership Podcast, where we talk about life, leadership, and the gospel. If you enjoyed this episode, share with a friend. For more content, follow us on Instagram and YouTube. If you have any questions you would like to ask TJ, whether it is about life, leadership, or the gospel, you can email those to TJ Malden Leadership Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you again for listening, and we hope you join us again on the TJ Malden Leadership Podcast.